E. Now, uh, here in Samuel, we're going to come to um, one of the, in, just in my opinion, one of the uh, stranger events in Scripture, which is the selection of Saul. That's one. Uh, the, only, the only thing I could figure is that Elohim said, so you don't want me to lead you as your king. You want some guy to do it. So I'm going to give you what you deserve. Some guy. Yeah. Yeah. We'll read about him here. 1 Samuel 1, verses, or 9, verses 1 and 2. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zerar, the son of Be uh, Becherath, the son of Aphia, the son of Benjamite, a mighty man of valor. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice and handsome man. There was not a more handsome person than he among the sons of Israel. From his shoulders and up, he was taller than any of the people. So there you go. You got uh, a tall, good-looking guy. But he had a deep voice, could speak well. Sure, he was charismatic. Had a beautiful smile, all his teeth. <clears throat> well, the people were previously Im impressed with the height of men when they uh, sent out spies into the land, if you'll recall. In Numbers 13, starting in verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we were not able to go up against the people for they're too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they'd spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone in, are gone and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There we also saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in their sight, and so we were in their sight. Uh, just as a real quick explanation, the term Nephilim does not mean giants. He says all the people were giants in the previous paragraph. They were all huge. And they were all Nephilim. Now, <clears throat> uh, the term, the root word is nephal, and it means fallen one. So he's saying that they're all, the, the land is filled with people who are evil. Okay, the eem on the end, that makes it plural, nephilim. That just means fallen ones. <clears throat> we see that before the flood also. That's what led to the destruction of the world, were uh, the sons of men being the sons of, sons of uh, excuse me, the sons of Elohim being the good people who Elohim, had, had brought along uh, to, to carry on his legacy, started mating with the daughters of men, meaning women that didn't believe. And he says, you can't do that. And what came out were Nephilim. Their kids were Nephilim. They were fallen ones. <clears throat> That's what will happen. Uh, when you get married, young people, you have to marry someone who believes, who's, who's store observant and loves Messiah. You have to. That's not an option. Well, aren't there many of those around? No, there's not that many of those around. I agree. I agree. <clears throat> but you can't fix it afterwards. All right, it ain't going to work, usually. A house divided will not stand. Yep. Yep. Yeshua said it. Abraham Lincoln said it. That's good enough. 1 Samuel 9, starting at verse 3. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to his son Saul, Take now with you one of the servants and arise, go search for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalishaw. Sounds like a city in Oklahoma. But they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjaminites, but they did not find them. Now, when they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servants who, who was with him, Come and let us return, lest my father cease to be concerned about the donkeys and become anxious for us. And he said to him, Behold, now there is a man of Elohim in this city, and the man is held in honor. All that he says surely comes true. Now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us about our journey on which we've set out. Okay, this is the providence of Elohim. The donkeys of Kish, they wandered off. And Kish sent Saul to look for him. 
And so Saul, he says, take a servant, go out there and look for him. And there's a man of Elohim in Zuf. And here's what they thought. Well, maybe if it's a man of Elohim, maybe he can tell us where our donkeys are. Okay. 1 Samuel 9, 7, Then Saul said to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is gone from our sack, and there's no present to bring to the man of Elohim. What do we have? Okay, now probably it was uh, customary to bring dignitaries' gifts, but this more likely shows, I would say, the way Saul is. You know, I think Saul's the kind of guy, if you want something out of him, uh, you're going to pay for it. And I think he thinks other people have that same mindset. So he thinks maybe we should pay the preacher, uh, excuse me, the prophet. Verses 8 and 9. And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have in my hand a fourth of a shekel of silver. I'll give it to the man of Elohim and he'll tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of Elohim, he used to say, Come and let us go to the seer, for he who was called a prophet now was formerly called a seer. So they're going to inquire of Elohim through a seer or a prophet. Um, that's interesting. Uh, they don't want to inquire of Elohim how to obey him. No, they want to, uh, they want something. Verses 10 through 12. And Saul said to his servant, well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of Elohim was. And as they went up the slope to the city, they found young women going out to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? And they answered them and said, he is. See, he's ahead of you. Hurry now, for he's come into the city today, for the people have a sacrifice on the high place today. So Saul traveled from Gibeon to Zuf. Uh, so it's just a few miles, because we're here, Gibeah, there's Zuf. <clears throat> um, and it's a hill city. Apparently Elohim sends Samuel to Zuf to do an offering. And it's all part of a plan for Samuel to meet Saul and to anoint him as king of Israel. Verses 13 and 14, as soon as you enter the city, you'll find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now therefore go up, for you, for you will find him at once. So they went up to the city. As they came to the city, behold, Samuel was coming out toward them to go up to the high place. The people will perform the, won't perform the sacrifice until Samuel blesses it. And Samuel was told by Elohim that Saul's going to be here. You're going to run into him, and this is the guy. He'll be coming into the town. Verse 15, Now a day before Saul's coming, Yahweh had revealed this to Samuel, saying, About this time tomorrow I'll send you a man from the land of Benjamin. You shall anoint him to be priest or prince over my people Israel, and he shall deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I've regarded my people, because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, Yahweh said to him, Behold the man of whom I spoke to you, this one shall rule over my people. So Elohim personally pointed out this guy. Saul is the guy. Verse 18, Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and in the morning I'll let you go, and will tell you all that is on your mind. And as for your donkeys, which were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they've been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's household? Samuel, uh, he already knew that uh, Saul was looking for his donkeys, for his daddy. <clears throat> he told them they'd been found. Everything's fine. Verse 21, And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite, a, a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me in this way? Then Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and gave them a place in the head of, of those who were invited, who were about 30 men. So uh, Saul is... <laughs> In my opinion, faking humility here. Um, he had to be impressed with Samuel's insight, everything that he knew about him. 
Verse 23, And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion that I gave you concerning which I said to you, set it aside. Then the cook took up the leg with what was on it and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Here is what has been reserved. Set it before you and eat, because it's been kept for you until the appointed time, since I said I've invited the people. So uh, Saul ate with Samuel that day. Um, Saul, Samuel gave Saul the shoulder, okay, or the thigh of the sacrifice. That is supposed to be the priestly portion. We read in Leviticus 7, verses 32 and 33, And you shall give the right thigh to the priest as a contribution from the sacrifices of your peace offerings. The one among the sons of Aaron who offers the blood of the peace offerings in the fat, the right thigh shall be his portion. Well, this is intended to Saul. Now he's being honored above all the other guests. Verse 25. When they came down from a high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the roof, and they arose early. And it came about at daybreak that Samuel called to Saul on the roof, saying, Get up that I may send you away. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out to, uh, into the street. As they were going down to the edge of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Say to the servant that he might go ahead of us and pass on, but you remain standing now that I may proclaim the word of Elohim to you. <clears throat> so, uh, a lot of times when we're studying these historical things, uh, this is just the event that happened. And I don't know that we're going to get a lot of... The a lot of uh, critical insights into the father by studying Saul, but we're going to keep going here. See, he, he, he baffles me. He baffles me. Is he actually Elohim's or not? What do you think? He's chosen to be king. He's not a good guy. Maybe for a time. You know, I think you're exactly right, Michael. Some people are just used for a time. In verse 1, then Samuel took the flask of oil, poured it on his head, and kissed him, and said, Has not Yahweh anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? <clears throat> um, Saul is anointed king of Israel here. Anointing signifies divine consecration to office. Priests and kings are anointed into office. Now, this should show us the meaning of some other passages in the Brit Hadashah. For instance... 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21, Now he who establishes us with you in Messiah and anointed us is Elohim. Hmm. 1 John 2, verse 20, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. And then skipping down to verse 27, And as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. You have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, just as it is taught you, you abide in him. This anointing means we have a, we're a part of a kingdom and we're priests. And we're to reign with Messiah Yeshua. Rev, uh, Revelation 1 verse 6, And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his Elohim and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Uh, keep in mind, this isn't talking about in the future. He says, he has made us to be a kingdom and priests. We are reigning with him right now, actually. Revelation 5, verse 10, And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our Elohim, and they'll reign upon the earth. <clears throat> Revelation 20, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they'll be priests of Elohim and of Messiah and will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, we've talked about this passage in the past. A thousand years is symbolic. It's, it means a short time, okay? Because he says uh, uh, in the Psalms, it says a thousand years is like a, a, a night watch, which is just a few hours. And then Peter quotes that, said it's just like a, uh, a day. So it's a short time. It says we'll be priests of Elohim and of Messiah and we'll reign with him for a short time. Uh, blessed and holy is the one who's a part in the first resurrection. When Yeshua said we have to be born again or born from above to be a part of the kingdom, that's what he means. You're reborn. You're resurrected. 
you were dead in your trespasses and sins, now you're born again. Now you are resurrected through the power of the breath of the Father. <clears throat> and over those, over these, the second death has no power. So the second death has no power over you. And it says we're priests. We'll reign with him the rest of our lives. Now this was Elohim's plan for his people all along. Back in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. We read, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. <clears throat> I was telling you earlier, we all ought to be happy. Yeah, we really should. Okay? We really should. Let's go back to our friend Saul here. 1 Samuel 10, verse 2. When you go for me today, then you'll find two men close to Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza. And they'll say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. Now behold, your father has ceased to be concerned about the donkeys and is anxious for you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you'll go on further from there, and you'll come as far as the Oak of Tabor. And there three men will, going up to Elohim at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a jug of wine. They'll greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from their hand. <clears throat> Samuel's telling Saul things that only Elohim could have revealed to him. He's telling Saul what's on his father's mind. He's telling Saul that his donkeys have been found. He, he tells them he's going to meet up with three men, and they're going to be carrying certain things. Verse 5, afterward you'll come to the hill of Elohim where the Philistine garrison is. Why do you think Samuel's telling him all this? He'll so he'll do it as one thing and also he'll know where the message is coming from. He must know. He's telling me things that only Elohim could know. So, granted they're, 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 they're not... Uh, Great spectacular things, but they don't have to be. He's telling him the things he's going to run into, what he's going to see. <clears throat> he says, afterward you'll come to the hill of Elohim where the Philistine garrison is. It shall be as soon as you've come there to the city that you'll meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and a lyre before them. And they'll be prophesying. Then the Spirit of Yahweh will come upon you mightily, and you shall prophesy with them and be changed into another man. Well, he says the spirit of Elohim is going to come upon him mightily and he'll prophesy. Now, I don't know what that really means to Saul to prophesy, but it's a sign for him. Verse 7, it shall be that when these signs come to you, do for yourself what the occasion requires, for Elohim is with you. And you shall go down before me to Gilgal. Behold, I'll come down to you to offer burnt offerings and, a sacri and sacrifice peace offerings. You shall wait seven days until I come to you and show you what you should do. Then it happened when he turned his back to leave Samuel, Elohim changed his heart. And all those signs came about on that day. Elohim changed his heart. Elohim gave Saul all the qualities necessary to be king and to be a leader and redeemer of the nation of Israel. Verse 10. When they came to the hill there, behold, a group of prophets met him. And the spirit of Elohim came, up mightily, came upon him mightily, so that he prophesied among them. It came about when all who knew him previously saw what, that he prophesied, now with the prophets, that the people said to one another, What has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And the man there answered and said, Now, who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he'd finished prophesying, he came to the high place. <clears throat> I don't know what Saul was prophesying. I would be curious to find out, but it doesn't say. Um, it's probably just speaking of the Torah. It's probably what it is. Verse 14, now Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, where did you go? And he said to look for the donkeys. When we saw that they could not be found, we went to Samuel. 
And Saul's uncle said, tell me what Samuel said to you. So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But he did not tell him about the matter of the kingdom which Samuel had mentioned. Okay, apparently Saul didn't feel like it was his place to tell his uncle that he's now king. I guess I, guess I could understand that. Verse 17, thereafter Samuel called the people together to Yahweh at Mizpah. And he said to the sons of Israel, thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, I brought Israel up from Egypt and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the power of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But you today rejected your Elohim who delivers you from all your calamities and your distresses. Yet you said no, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before Yahweh by your tribes and by your clans. Elohim's going to give them a king, just like they asked for. But it's, he's not doing it for their own good. He's judging them for rejecting him as being king. That's what this whole Saul thing's about. It's a judgment. Think our nation's being judged? Boy, I do. Look at the leadership we have. Oh, my gosh. How the heck did that happen? It's another Saul. I think I'd trade him for a Saul. <laughs> okay, I'm about to get the shepherd's crook here to pull me off stage. I better. <clears throat> you know, the uh, one, one thing, uh, when, I, when I was young, I remember they started to say, you should never discuss religion and politics. Don't discuss religion and politics. Uh, you hear that a lot when you were young? I did. My mother didn't pay attention to it, but I was told that a lot. Um, you know what that's led to? People who are ignorant about religion and politics. It's exactly what that's led to. Especially among family. You, gotta, you have to talk about scripture. You need to talk about politics. <clears throat> I know who I, I know who everyone who's lived in my house who they're going to vote for. So if you get my vote, you get six votes, and then their spouses, you get ten votes. <clears throat> anyway, thereafter Samuel called the people together to Yahweh at Mizpah, and he said to the sons of Israel, "Thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt." And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the power of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. You know, how many times has that been brought up? The history again of, the, of Exodus? How many times do they bring it up? You know, I remember Stephen brought it up before they stoned him. Peter brought it up uh, on, the, on the day of Pentecost. Paul brought it up a lot. <clears throat> Why do they keep bringing it up? Because you're supposed to remember. We're supposed to remember what our Father's done for us. And you know what we should be? Grateful. We should be grateful. But today you rejected your Elohim who delivers you from all your calamities and your distresses. Yet you said, no, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before Yahweh by your tribes and by your clans. I, you know, I th I'm wondering, I would be scared with that kind of an introduction. Okay? Okay, now everybody line up. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> Verse 20. Thus Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its families, and the Mat uh, Matrite family was taken. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken, but when they looked for him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired further of Yahweh, Has the man come here yet? So Yahweh said, Behold, he's hiding himself by the baggage. So they ran and took him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Saul's hiding in the baggage. He's somewhat reluctant to take this position as king. <clears throat> 
I wonder how tall he was. When I say he's taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Got to be. Got to be tall. Verse 24. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom Yahweh has chosen? Surely there's no one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. You know what the people wanted? Good looks and height. Yes, sir. That's what they wanted. <clears throat> So the people looked at his stature, and they cheered. Yay! Verse 25. Then Samuel told the people the ordinances of the kingdom, and wrote them in the book, and placed it before Yahweh. Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his house. Now, I don't know. Uh, it says Samuel told the people the ordinances of the kingdom. I, I don't know what he said, what the ordinances of the kingdom were, but I think... It's those that have to do with, uh, concerning a king. And those are in Deuteronomy 17, starting in verse 14. When you enter the land which Yahweh your Elohim gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I'll set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, you shall surely set a king over, over you whom Yahweh your Elohim chooses. One from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not a countryman. <clears throat> Moreover, you shall not multiply horses for himself. He shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to re return to Egypt to multiply horses. Since Yahweh has said to you, you shall never again return that way. Um, so here he's already saying, I know what you're going to do. You're going to set. You're going to want a king set over set over yourselves. Okay, I know this is what you're going to want. Um, and when you do, he's going to be one of your countrymen. It's going to be an Israelite. Um, boy, no, I'm not going to say a Kenyan joke. He shall not multiply horses for himself. That's what, uh, that's what Solomon did. He multiplied horses for himself. Uh, and don't cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Where do you think Solomon got his horses from? Egypt. Yeah. And then he continues, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself. Well, he stopped at 700 and only 300 concubines. So, <clears throat> lest his heart turn away, boy, his heart turned away. Nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Uh, he did that too. They say silver was like rocks in Israel in that day. Now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this Torah on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahweh his Elohim by carefully observing all the words of this Torah and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, in order that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. Uh, I think that's probably what um, the ordinances spoken of by Samuel were. There may have been more. And lastly, verses 26 and 27, And Saul also went to his house at Gibeah, and the valiant men whose hearts Elohim had touched went with him. But certain worthless men said, How can this one deliver us? And they despised him and did not bring him any present, but he kept silent. You know, there's a dissenter in every group almost. There was one here too. Uh, the people are going to want to put him to death in the next chapter, and Saul's going to stop them from doing that. <clears throat> Any, uh, any thoughts about 1 Samuel? Chapters 9 and 10. Well, the people are going to get what they deserve. They're going to get a creep for a king. He's going to be selfish. He's going to think more of himself than he does his people. Uh, he's going to be the antithesis of his successor, his David. Okay, uh, let's... Uh, Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We, uh, we pray, Father, that, <clears throat> that uh, we appreciate the, uh, the, the way you've blessed us as individuals, as families, and as a group, as an assembly of yours. We, uh, we pray, Father, that you do continue to write your Torah, our, your Torah on our hearts and minds. Draw us closer to you in love and obedience. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen.